You're listening to The Leonard Lopez Show on AM820 and 93.9 WNYC. A new documentary from Andy Abrahams Wilson called Under Our Skin follows various Americans affected by and living with Lyme disease. But it's more than just the story of the difficulties that people have coping with the illness. The film also reveals how and why Lyme disease treatment in the United States has become a controversial issue, with some doctors even losing their licenses because of the ways in which they have treated patients. Under Our Skin was an audience award finalist at the Tribeca Film Festival. It opens tonight at the IFC Center on 6th Avenue in Greenwich Village. And Andy Abrahams Wilson and Mandy Hughes, whose case is featured in the film, join me now. Welcome to our show. Thank you. Thank you. Andy, what got you interested in making a documentary about Lyme disease? Uh, Did you have a personal connection? Well, I think you have to have a personal connection um, in order to, to delve into this disease. Um, otherwise, the assumption is, why are you, why are you interested in it? And um, that was where I was coming from before I was personally affected. Um, a friend of mine got very sick in, in California with mysterious symptoms, severe neurological problems, and she was diagnosed with MS and then ALS, which is basically a death sentence, and then finally Lyme disease. And, in uh, California, I this thought this was ca- really a, an well, eastern condition. That's what I thought. And because my twin sister had had Lyme disease maybe 10 years ago, she lives in upstate New York, and I just remember she was always um, sick and tired. And that's kind of what I remember about Lyme disease. And um, I remember that she complained that she couldn't get treated, and then she finally did get treated, and it seemed like it went away. So that was my only understanding of Lyme disease, and I think that's sort of what most people think about it. Um, But it's interesting that she had been diagnosed with other things first. Is it really hard to diagnose Lyme disease? uh, You're you're talking about my friend in California. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is very difficult to to diagnose, and that's that's what I one of the things that I did discover. Um, And um, quite frankly, I was just shocked. I was shocked that this that Lyme disease could do that to you. I was shocked that it wasn't just on the East Coast. Um, I was shocked to find that it affected so many people, and I was shocked that, that it wasn't easily diagnosed. So you must have uh, had no difficulty getting a lot of people who wanted to appear in your film. Not at all. <laughs> there, are, there are untold numbers of people who are afflicted with this, and they are falling through the cracks. What about you, Mandy? Did you have any reservations about appearing in this film? Or your, did your husband? Um, well, yeah. I, Why? Well, just because of the nature of the disease and the path that we had had to take, you know, just to receive treatment and to get a diagnosis, uh, we knew that it wouldn't necessarily, you know, be easy, but that it's a story that must be told. Because uh, also it has to be very frustrating. People <laughs> often are not paying attention or yes. dismissing you. Uh, where were you physically when Andy began filming you? Um, as <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to feel that? I, well, I just want to mention here that it's it's uh, w- one of the funny story is that is that Mandy sent us a letter um, almost as if this were an audition for a reality TV show <laughs> because you had a show business background, didn't you? Well, I was an you, animal trainer, but for, for, at SeaWorld. Yeah, it was more of a act of desperation, I guess. No, but she was what, what it really showed is not that she was looking for some kind of celebrity, but she was so committed to this issue that had affected her so deeply and she really wanted to educate other people so they didn't have to go through the same thing. And you took a a particularly close look at Mandy's situation because her case was so severe at the time? Well, I think there were a lot of factors there. One factor was that um, she and her husband, um, pardon the expression Mandy, was sort of the all-American couple. Um, and they they played good. They you know they looked they looked the part in a way. And and she had just been diagnosed, even though she was sick for years and years. And she was starting her journey with Lyme disease or with Lyme disease treatment, just as she was starting her treatment. I mean, just she was starting her journey with marriage. And so that was the very first thing that we filmed. I went down to to Florida um, by myself to film, and um, so um, that really was what launched it. And you you just got married when you the condition got really bad? Um, no, it was actually before that, two years prior. That I had really started to decline to the point where I couldn't really speak, I couldn't really walk. So I had to rest up for the wedding <laughs> in order for me to be able to walk down the aisle. Uh, well, that puts a lot of pressure on 
on a marriage, doesn't it? It does. Uh, any major illness can take its toll on both the family and you know the marriage. And Lyme disease was looming over that marriage. You know, I just dropped in with my camera, but you could you could feel it. I mean, you could you could sort of cut it with a knife, so to speak. That that um, that was the invisible force was Lyme disease. And would Mandy get through the wedding? What was going to happen? Um, and um, you know, it was wonderful to see the support that she got from the family, um, and and um, it was it really was uncharted territory. We weren't sure which way it would go. How old were you when you were diagnosed with Lyme disease? The first time, nineteen, and then. But uh, but it didn't one specialist say to you, "You're an attractive girl, and clearly you don't feel like you're getting enough attention." That is correct. Um, I had been diagnosed uh, three times uh, with MS, and then it was retracted. And then I was diagnosed with dystonia. And then um, because I didn't feel that the doctor was really addressing some of the situations that I had, um, I think that that doctor was a little offended and made the comment. Now, why is it so hard to diagnose this illness? Uh, doesn't it show up in your blood the way any other illness does? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good question. It's an obvious question. Um, but the fact is, um, uh, it, it's like uh, it's like throwing a dart at the wall um, towards a target, and maybe it'll hit, and maybe it won't. Um, tests are about fifty percent accurate. Um, these are the teeter tests that they give. Yes, and these are the standard conventional tests that if you go to your doctor and just uh, get a Lyme disease test, that's what they'll do. So, um, is that the best test? Or are there other tests? There are there are other there are specialty so called specialty labs. Um, they're controversial um, because the, the the mainstream medical establishment doesn't like it. Um, and um, it's seen as a threat to their authority, but they are the labs that the so-called Lyme literate physicians are using because they tend to be more accurate. Now, what were you experiencing? Uh, first of all, did you have that, that roseate target thing that we often are told is the first sign, the bullseye, the first thing uh, that uh, suggests that you've been bitten by a tick? Yes, when I was 19. So and wasn't that enough of a reason for somebody to say Lyme disease? No, they were, I mean, they were questioning it at that time as well because not. I don't think that they were very confident at that time um, with trying to rule out, you know, everything else and rule in a diagnosis of Lyme. And, and then at that time it became disseminated as well, which means it spread everywhere else. And I had um, large bullseye rashes all over my body. And I even had pictures of it to present to physicians um, once I started to, you know, digress again at age 22. And what did they say when they saw those photographs? Lyme can't do that. Lyme yeah. doesn't come back like that. You've already been treated. So physicians, so physicians don't know um, how to how to spot the the bullseye rash, and that um, many physicians don't even know that it. Um, that if you get a bullseye rash, that means you have Lyme disease. You don't even need to get a test. Um, and it, that's true even today. A, a listener writes, uh, a vet told uh, him or her, I don't know what it is, uh, that if you get the tick off before 48 hours have passed, it won't have time to get all of that stuff in your blood system. Is that true? How do you know how long the tick's been there? Most of the time when you see it, how, how long has it been there? How long is has it, it already been on you? And then the the, the, the follow-up is, uh, is it important to take a shower? How, how good is it to remove the tick? Yeah. Uh, and what should you use, a match, tweezers? How do you get the head <laughs> of the tick off? <laughs> well, I think, uh, you know, first of all, I want to say that, that, that um, I'm a filmmaker. I'm not a physician. Although it, in, in uh, working five years on this film, I think I, in some ways I know more than a lot of physicians about Lyme disease. Um, and I'm sure that most of the people with Lyme disease know a lot more than the doctors <laughs> do as well, because they have to, right? Yes, exactly. This is true. Exactly. But um, uh, it, that is a controversial point about how long the tick needs to be embedded before it can transmit Lyme. Um, some 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 experts will say that uh, five hours or ten hours that, um, and um, you 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 can't um, you can't just assume that just because the the tick has not been embedded. Um, for for too long that that means you're you're not at risk for Lyme disease. And I understand also the bullseye rash doesn't occur in all people. Correct. Correct. And who would think that something so small could pass so much through to the human body? 
Well, what and, is it putting into your body, Mandy? Well, I mean, it can put anything. American malaria. It can put cat scratch disease. I mean, that's just a couple. But what yeah. is Lyme disease? Well, that's I mean that's that's another great question. Like it's, I mean it, it seems like an like a, an obvious question, but they but, haven't um, they haven't isolated a bacillus or well yes I mean Lyme disease is uh, um, spirochete. It's, it's a spirochete which is a form of bacteria, um, and uh, it's actually named after the person who discovered it, which is Willy Burgdorfer. Um, it's called uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, and um, it's uh, it's a a genetic cousin of syphilis, which is also a spirochete. Um, and because it's a spirochete, a spiral-shaped um, microorganism, it can drill into different parts of the bodies. It, it is not, does not just stay in the blood. Um, it goes into the heart. It goes into the central nervous system. It goes into joint fluid, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why people with Lyme disease ha have multi-system, multi-symptom um, problems. 